Okay, hello everyone, and um, welcome to the um, welcome to the the webinar today. Um, I'm going to be talking about applying ORCID in in publishing. Um, and thank you for inviting us to um, to join you today. We're sorry that we can't be there in person. My name is Rachel Lamy. I'm head of community outreach at Crossref, and I'll prepare. I'll be presenting first um, and I'm joined by Estelle Cheng who is um, the manager of Asia Pacific engagement for um, for ORCID um, so it's 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 nice to be nice to be sharing the the screen with her today um, I'm going to spend some time talking about how at Crossref we work with um, we work with ORCID and ORCID IDs um, and then Estelle is going to talk um, from the ORCID perspective about how that works and tell you a little bit more about ORCID and how it can be used in research and, and publishing workflows. Um, I think because there are people joining the, the webinar um, via a conference, but then also, um, also remotely. Um, we're going to take questions at the, the end of our presentations, either via the, um, most of them, I think, sort of via the chat window so that we don't get background noise, that we can take questions um, via the speaker as well. So, let me go ahead and get started and we will make a recording of this webinar and send it to to everyone who joins um, so that you have a record of it and so that you can go back and check it again over time if you need to so i wanted to start at the basics because sometimes people will ask okay cross ref dois orchid ids What's the difference? Are they not just the same thing? So Crossref DOIs are, they're issued to, um, they're issued to content that's published. So things like journal articles, books, conference proceedings and more. So they're, they're issued to, um, to research outputs. So things that can be published, can be posted online um, and, and tend to result as a product from research. ORCID IDs, they're persistent identifiers, but more for people. So Estelle will talk about this more, but their purpose is to distinguish you and, and the authors from the journals that you publish from all of the other different researchers that are out there in the world. So Crossref and ORCID, you can tell that what we do is um, it's complementary to each other. Um, so when, um, when ORCID was created, um, it was necessary to, um, it, was, it was a way to kind of help Crossref members um, because it's great, to have, it's great to have a unique identifier for publications. So you know whenever you're citing using a DOI that you're uniquely identifying a specific research article. But the members, the publishers that we worked with and lots of other people were interested in getting a similar unique identifier for the authors of their publications so that they could be unmistakably linked to those publications. So I look at a piece of, I look at a journal article and I want to make sure that the author that I associate with it is correct. I think as, you know, as an author, I know a lot of people on the call are journal editors, but you're also researchers who are publishing, um, who are publishing. And you'll have lots of different databases and profiling systems where you have to try to keep a record of and report on the publications that you have. And it's such a pain, you don't want to have to manually update that information across lots of the different um, databases or records that you have. You want to spend time doing your research and writing papers. So at Crossref, obviously we sort of thought, well, it's, it's not quite enough just to, just to say, oh yeah, ORCID's great. Um, we think that researchers should get this. We think that research managers should use it. We really wanted to, to make sure that we integrated the ORCID identifiers for authors into our systems. 
And the way that this happens, again, Estelle will talk about it a bit more, but Crossref members can collect ORCID IDs from their authors, normally at the point where an author makes a submission to a journal. So as well as collecting information about who wrote the paper, what the paper is, the abstract, the references, that we're also collecting, um, the members are also collecting the ORCID IDs of the authors on the paper. Then, if they choose to publish that paper, at the point where they register the, um, the content with us and they activate the DOI, they can also send us in the, the ORCID IDs for the authors within the Crossref metadata. Again, it's not enough for us just to take the information. When we see in Crossref that a publication has been registered with us, and it contains the ORCID IDs for the authors, we tell the author about that so that they can automatically add it to their ORCID record. So let me just talk you through the stages of how that works. So this is the, these are the, the parts where Crossref members can add ORCID IDs to their publications metadata when they register it with Crossref. So some of you might be using um, what we call our web deposit form, the top example on this page. The web deposit form is quite a manual way to, to register information with Crossref, but you can see when you come to the, when you come to the page where you have to enter the article information, you have to enter the title, and then when you're entering who the authors are on that paper, there's a field where you can enter their ORCID ID for them. So once you do that and you register the content using the web deposit form, then at Crossref, we'll receive those ORCID IDs and we can use them. Similarly, if any of you are working with or using the, the metadata manager tool, then again, um, there's a field when you enter the author information connected with the paper where you can add the author's ORCID ID. And again, we package that up with the metadata that the, the member has entered, and then we, we, then we use it when they register the DOIs with us. You can see at the bottom of the screen that there is, I know a lot of um, organizations in Southeast Asia and especially in Indonesia use the OJS or Open Journal Systems platform. And Estelle will talk about this in more detail, but you can see that within OJS um, 2.4 and above and OJS 3, um, within the author and user profiles, the ORCID IDs can be collected. So OJS supports the collection and deposit of ORCID IDs. And if those are collected from, um, from the author's profile, then OJS will automatically include that in the Crossref metadata for deposit. The picture on screen is exactly how the ORCID ID appears in the Crossref metadata. So it's in this contributor section where we collect the author information related to a paper. So very simple. You can see that in this instance, this is the first author. I've got their, their, their first or given name and their surname and then the ORCID ID presented as the full link. So not just the number, the full ORCID link. So if you're using Open Journal Systems, chances are that you'll, you'll never see the ORCID ID, but what you will do is it will be automatically collected and sent to Crossref if you're using that particular piece of information. So as I said, I wanted to talk about what we actually do when we receive that information. Um, because we do a couple of things with it. But a really big thing that we did back in 2015 is that we started to, um, we implemented what's called auto-update functionality. Auto-update means that when we see the ORCID ID in the Crossref metadata, 
we will get in touch with the author to let them know that Crossref can see a publication that's associated with them as an author. And it gives them the choice to add that publication to their ORCID record, either just for this one publication or for anything else that Crossref sees in future that's related to their ORCID ID. Um, I've linked to this blog post in the slides, which I'll share as well, but you can just search for our blog or there's an ORCID page in our website, which describes what, what we do with this information. As I said, I've, I've sort of walked through this already, but as I said, when publishers deposit the ORCID with, with article metadata, we ask the author for long-term permission to post that and any future works to their ORCID record. This asking step is really important because as a researcher, you need to be able to control what is posted to your ORCID ID. At the end of the day, you have the final say as to what's on there, what isn't, and how private or public that information is. I think if, I, I think if um, the sort of default thing that I would say is that if it will, it's a, it's a kind of a time saver and helps to populate your ORCID record if you allow this. But equally, we understand that there are instances where a researcher might not want to, and, and that is that's supported within this workflow. But once you do give permission or any papers you give permission for, we'll post those works to your author's record and future publications from any Crossref member. So that could be from any of Crossref's 12,000 publisher members. So you don't have to go in and reauthorize it each time a different publisher wants to publish something that you've produced. Said, if that's the case, any author that we've seen deposited with, the, with that ORCID ID in the past will also get pushed to the record after permission has been granted. So there's no kind of additional step there. So if we see an ORCID associated with the researcher's work in, in the Crossref system, this is how it will appear in the, the author's ORCID inbox. And they should get an email about it as well. But what that will do is it will tell them that Crossref sending them a notification. We're asking to add a work to your ORCID record and when that request has come in. Um, when, you, um, when you extend that message or you go into it, you can see that this is the message that um, the authors will be sent. We're explaining who Crossref is and what we do. And then it will show the, it will show the, the author the work that we could see their ORCID ID associated with. So again, it's useful for the researcher to be able to double check to make sure that it is their work. And it's really good. Sometimes the, um, the researcher will get a notification via ORCIDs that their paper has been published before they even get one from the publisher. So, so it's, quite, it's quite nice in that way because then they can start to promote it. And then all they need to do is grant permission to, um, by clicking on that button highlighted in red. And that will ask if they want to grant permissions just for this paper for all papers are everywhere, or if they want to, if they want to deny permission. Um, there's a question come in to say, um, to ask about the benefit of having an ORCID account for an author and a journal editor. Um, I think for the, um, I think as a journal editor, it can be useful to, to have an ORCID because chances are you're going to be also a researcher yourself and you might be publishing papers that you would want to associate with your ORCID record and have a list of your publications so that anyone who's interested in publishing in the journal can see what your area of research is and what your specialties are, maybe to see if, a, if, a, if it's a good fit for them to publish in. And it said that the benefits then for the author is that um, is that they can they can collect and they can show their publications simply and easily 
and not have to manually update those in a record every time they publish something new. Um, if they do grant permissions for, um, for the, 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 these articles to be added to their record, um, it will look like this on their, um, on their ORCIDs on their ORCID record. So if you have an ORCID, um, this is what your, your kind of ORCID um, record will look like. In this instance, it's my colleague Ed. I can see his ORCID, where he's based. He's associated with it, with other IDs. And I can see that in this instance, if I've added a rec, if I've added a work to my ORCID record using auto update, then I will be able to see the source of that of that edition is Crossref. So it's sort of saying that um, it's sort of lending validation or weight to the source of the information so that um, they can see that it's tied to Crossref or tied to the publisher or another source. So it's not that the, the researcher is adding all of this information by typing it all in themselves. It's always interesting to see kind of how this is going, um, you know, how, how, how many, how much information is being updated regularly. So this is just a snapshot from our status page at Crossref. And I can see that, um, for example, in, um, in, in August of this year, so even, so this was August um, at the top was August 2018. And you can see in August 2019, there's been a real increase um, from this time last year in terms of the, the number of researchers who are authors who are granting permission to ORCID to auto update their records. Um, September, that's just not a complete month's figure yet. I took this snapshot a couple of weeks ago when I was preparing the slides. And you can see that there have been nearly 120,000 works added to authors' ORCID records. So that's 120,000 times a researcher hasn't had to go and manually add that information. So that's, that's, that's pretty good. And you can see that it's being used a lot and that the rate of uptake is, is increasing over time. Looking at the total figures since we started to, um, to do auto updates, so I can see that there are now nearly um, 5 million ORCID article pairs. So 5 million articles that have at least one ORCID associated with, with them so that you're able to match the, you're, you're reliably able to match the, the author with the work that they've published. I would say just to flag up these figures at the end, um, lots, nearly 800,000 authors granting permission to ORCID to add to their records. <coughs> there are some denying, but there are also some not responding. So being honest, I think some of this is, is lack of knowledge of the authors about um, of authors about what Crossref is trying to do um, or why they might want to give Crossref permission to add content to the ORCID records. So I think as, um, as journal editors um, or even um, authors yourselves, I think it's kind of a good prompt to, to know that this, is, this service is trying to help, but also um, when you're talking to authors and researchers to let them know that this is a good thing um, so that it might save them work um, later on. As said, so nowadays we've got um, over 2 million, um, 2 million records, 2 million publications with ORCID IDs associated with them. So these are kind of our overall um, cross-ref figures. Um, but that's, that's, that's a big number based on, um, based on how many ORCID IDs there are and how many papers are being published with Crossref every year. Um, and it means that there are, as said, 3,900, so nearly 4,000 publishers, individual publishers or individual Crossref members who are registering ORCID IDs in their Crossref metadata. When we launched auto-update in 2015, I think there were probably about 
80 publishers, 80 publishers from all of the, the 12,000 Crossref members who were registering ORCID IDs with Crossref. So this is really big and healthy growth over the last four years. And it's something that lots of publishers are now starting to do as standard. What you can do is if you're interested to look and see if your publication is registering ORCID IDs, um, you can see that there's this link at the bottom of the page, which is a link to Crossref's participation reports. And you can go to that link and you can do a search for your publication. And what that will show is what metadata Crossref can see that's being registered by a particular publication. So in this instance, for this Crossref member who've registered 226 DOIs, they have ORCID IDs associated with 18% of those. So, um, so they, would they are collecting and registering ORCID IDs with Crossref. And I think as, as researchers get even more familiar with, with ORCID over time, that percentage will grow. But I think it's been useful for us to show this information very simply as Crossref, because we did find that some publications were asking authors to add their ORCID records um, or to give them ORCIDs when they submitted to the journal. But then they, they wouldn't actually be sending that information to Crossref, so we couldn't do the, the extra automatic step. So if you think that you're if you think that you're registering ORCID records with your publications, do just go in and double check. And if you're not sure, just get in touch with us and we'll we'll try to help you add that step into your into your publication workflows. The other important thing is, so yes, we do auto update, but we also share the 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 ORCID IDs that we collect from authors. And you can see that these come in in different languages, but we collect that information and we make it available via our, our APIs. So what that means is that any organization, um, say, for example, today I was talking to a funder. What a funder could do is if they, if they know the ORCID ID of one of their researchers, they could enter they could enter that into into crossref they could search our api for that information and they could pull back all of the all of the publications that that crossref can see from that from that author so it can help people search and find collaborators and help find um, other people who are working in their field and see a full record of of all of the publications from a specific author so there there's making the information available via various tools and services means that there are just even more ways for people to find and use your publications. So again, from a journal editor perspective, I want people to find the research that I publish. So associating an ORCID ID with the publications gives anyone interested another way or another method to search for your content. So it's a good thing in terms of discoverability as well. Said we've got, um, a, you might have seen this before, um, what's called Crossref Metadata Search. Um, and it might be that a publisher hasn't associated your ORCID ID with, um, with the record. That's okay. It doesn't mean that you can't use Crossref to add the, the publication to your ORCID record. So you can see in this instance, I've gone to, to search.crossref.org. I've typed in my name. It helps that I have quite, an un, you know, quite a unique name, but I do have an ORCID ID as well. And what I can do is I can sign in with my, um, with my ORCID ID and I can add any of the publications that are relevant to me to my ORCID record. So it's just a case of selecting them as opposed to entering the information from scratch. And you can see when I do that, that the source is listed as Crossref Metadata Search. 
So it's showing the, the source of the information that I've used to add things to my ORCID record. And again, I think it's good practice just to make sure that if researchers have ORCID records that they use them because it is a way for people to find their research. So I'm just about to um, just about to hand over to um, to Estelle, um, but I wanted to kind of try to give the bigger picture in that an article doesn't just exist out there on its own. It's tied to maybe a preprint, to data, to other articles, and it's also tied to people as well. It's tied to maybe a book editor, it's tied to authors, and then those authors have in turn published different works, different data, um, and even done pre peer reviews or published conference papers. So it's a way to kind of see the ecosystem or the research work that sits that sits around one person and their collaborators. So adding ORCID will help us make those links between research. This is the page that I've linked to in my slides that shows, um, that sort of takes you through the different ways that, that Crossref integrates with, with ORCID. And obviously my, my email address to get in touch if you have any questions. Um, I'd also say that, as I said, if you, if you want to collect ORCID IDs and you're not sure how to, um, Estelle's going to walk you through how that works in open journal systems, but you can also get in touch with, um, with our support teams who are very happy to help. And I'll add the, the Crossref support team information into, um, into this slide as well so that we can share it with you after the webinar. Um, but yeah, I wanted to say thank you for, um, for your interest in this. Um, ORCID's something that we've spent a lot of time working with in, in Crossref. Um, and we think that we can, we, we can continue to strengthen our links um, over time. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. And hello, everyone. And nice to meet you here. I guess it's time for me to start my presentation. So let me start sharing my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Estelle Chen. Let me. Yeah. Yeah, you're good. Good? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Estelle Chen. Um, I'm now the manager of APEC engagement team at ORCID. So today I'm going to share with you some uh, tips or some more information about applying ORCID in publishing and uh, as well as for research institutes, how to implement ORCID, how to make the most benefits out of ORCID. So yeah, let me just get to my next slides. Okay, yeah. So uh, I think today in my presentation or in this webinar, I would like to start with a bit of challenges we will meet in the research world. And I will uh, share more about how publishers and uh, research institutes can tackle those challenges by integration with ORCID. And in the end, I will bring up some tips and some actions that you can take to really work with us. Yeah, the very first is that I would like to start uh, about net ambiguity. As Rachel raised, the value or the vision of ORCID is to uniquely identify researchers and help researchers to connect to their uh, works. It's more just than publications, but a, a variety of different research outputs. So uh, as you know now, names are not unique. Names are opaque sometimes. Names can change through marriage or other circumstances. And many people have the same name. And the people use different versions of their name. And people may use different abbreviations, etc. So rely on names are not tr uh, alone, are not just trustworthy enough. 
And uh, owing to the fact that researchers are mobile, for example, 30% of the scientists who got their PhD in the United Kingdom now live elsewhere. So researchers, researchers move around. So for research institutions and organizations, it's quite hard to benchmark their organization against others because researchers are mobile. If you need, you need something more concrete, an identifier to help you to identify researchers and their works, especially about affiliations and the contributions because they move around. And in those backgrounds, institutions actually face a rising tide of research. Uh, as I just shared, every year over 3 million scholarly articles will be published. That's quite a huge number. And more about, uh, there are about 40,000 active scholarly peer re reviewed journals. So uh, taking all this together, institutions must increasingly recognize and demonstrate the impact of all types of research contributions, other than just publications. And in fact, there are you know, more and more different uh, research outputs are there. And in particular, I want to stress some voices from the publishing side. So as just uh, shared in the research, uh, in the publication workflow, and there are actually some audience uh, ask questions like, what will benefit an author or a, uh, an editor if they got the ORCID ID? So here we, first we come from some challenge, uh, we start from some challenges. So as an editor, you definitely will be interested in credit incentives and accountability for your contributors, like for your uh, peer review, peer reviewers and for your authors. And as a publisher, you will be interested in knowing how accurate your data is. And you definitely want a easier working flow to manage those data. And as an author, you are interested in credit. You want to be acknowledged by papers or by research outputs you complete. So those are some voices from the publishing side. So yeah, it uh, relates to all these challenges actually relate to our uh, value. So why ORCID IDs are important. I will start from a bit about introducing ORCID. So actually, as you know, ORCID is an identifier for researchers. That's why we name it like ORCID ID, and it's a registry. So all researchers can go to register for an ORCID ID themselves. And we work with different uh, organizations to implement ORCID to help your researchers by uh, after they got the ORCID ID for themselves. And uh, how does this happen? We provide a set of standard procedures we call APIs for, for our members, our member organizations to connect researchers to their affiliations and activities. And ORCID is a nonprofit organization. We are driven by our communities. We do have communities world, worldwide. And we are international scale. This uh, is a basic uh, introduction for the ORCID community. So at present, we have about a thousand organizational members from different countries. And we have over 600 systems that are integrated with ORCID from different rich research sectors, from publishers, research institutes, grant funders, and also like associations. So I will say we want to be the trusted infrastructure for, for the research ecosystem. And now we have over 7 million researchers registered in ORCID ID. We work with different consortia over the globe, like in Americas, AMIA, and in APAC. And as I just shared, uh, ORCID are identifies people. Uh, and we are not, we don't work alone. We work with different uh, ID providers. Like we work with Crossref, they are, uh, depart they are assigning DOIs to contents. And we work with different uh, people identifiers like Scopus or Research ID. So 
I just want to highlight that uh, with ORCID is actually uh, providing value added for you to work with different identifiers from people identifier to content identifier and even place identifier like green or red gold. And here are some evidence to show uh, that uh, with ORCID integrations, staff actually save some time by ORCID integrations. Like in UK, you can save some labor. In protocol, you can save researchers hours. In Australia, especially in the grant application, it will save you huge time. So the most important for ORCID ID is to going to help you to reduce manual, bird, uh, manual burden and to help you facilitate your process in the whole research workflow. And how organizations and researchers benefit? I think the very first for institutes, for organizations, it can save your time and reduce errors with automated information sharing. We ask the API to do the labor work. And also with trusted machine data, you can manage your data, manage your organization's name and your research names more easier and in a more reliable way. And maintain links with your researchers from the past, present and future. And if you are a researcher, having an ORCID ID will definitely help you uh, to identify yourself better, to improve recognition and discoverability of yourself and you, of your research. And it means you can spend more time doing research instead managing it. It's actually very time, time consuming to manage your stuff in the research workflow. And uh, with an ORCID ID for researchers, you can control and manage those data in a more trustworthy way because your organizations will help you to insert those stuff. I will uh, show you more in the later slides. And just want to mention that for researchers, it's cost nothing. You can just sign to the ORCID registry to apply for an ORCID ID yourself. Yeah, so here comes a, a conclusion that I want to share with you is, is that unique research identifiers have the potential to bring efficiency and transparency to the creation and reuse of information for research evaluation. I just want to say that uh, during the research workflow, we all want trusted data, we want less labor, and by ORCID ID and also Crossref, the help of Crossref. DOI all can be achieved. And in the next slides, I'm going to share a little more about how ORCID operates in publishing workflow, especially about best practice for publishing organizations. Yeah, here I'm going to start with a diagram for publishers. It's called a collect and connect workflow. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, for those, yeah. So I want to start. There are actually five steps for organizations to start working with ORCID. The very first step is called authenticate. The next step is called display. Yeah, I will share my PowerPoint slides, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, just let me start here. Yeah, great, I will start from here again. Yeah, I'm going to share with uh, those organizations some uh, the best practice for working with ORCID. So there are five steps, authenticate, display, collect, and connect, and synchronize. I will introduce each a little bit more. So first, Oh, the, the diagram actually illustrates how an organization can work with ORCID and the best practice for work with ORCID. So first, by authenticate. So if you are a member or, or if you, you are not a member, you can either way you can use the ORCID API to collect and authenticate the contributor's ORCID ID. 
So it means you will ask the permission from the researchers to let them know that you are going to help the researcher maintain and update their ORCID records. And after you get their permission, you will include the ORCID ID into metadata. So for publishers, you will include this ORCID ID in your metadata when you are going to deposit DOI from Crossref. This just actually illustrate by ratio. And also you can display the ORCID ID of your researchers in your journal, like your journal published web page or in your publications PDF. This is in point two, so display the author or contributor's authenticated ORCID ID on the journal page, and it will can it can link back to the contributor's ORCID record. The third step is either collect or connect. So for collect, it collect it means using ORCID API, you can collect information from ORCID, and by collecting those information, you can fill those information into your system. We call it pre-fill, or even you can populate these profiles within your system. And for connect, it means you can use ORCID API to push works from your system to ORCID records. So here it goes. And the connect feature is only available in member API. So ORCID members can use those member API to connect publication metadata from ORCID, uh, from your system to ORCID. And I will share with you more by taking the example of open journal system. And in the end, the best uh, vision is to synchronize. So by ORCID API, you can synchronize your data between your system, your publisher system, or your research management system with ORCID record. And further, you can synchronize those data with other system as well. Like if you are a publisher, probably, probably you can uh, assert those to research management systems or even funder system or HR employment system. Oh, here it goes. Yeah, I just want to, uh, I know uh, there are some members or some organizations who are feel a little bit confused about ORCI API. Uh, so actually nowadays, ORCI provides two kinds of API. One is called public, it's free for anyone. So any individuals can use it, but only under individual's name, it's not allowed to under an organization's name. So, and we have member API, it means you join as one of uh, you become an ORCID member and these are the benefits you can use. So for public API, you can authenticate and collect uh, researchers ORCID ID and you can display and then you can collect data. But for public API, uh, you can only collect data that are made public. In ORCID records, uh, researchers have the ability to set up their privacy settings. There are three levels, public, uh, trusted organization and the private. So if you are an ORCID member, you are eligible to acquire permissions to read trust organization data because you ask your researchers to give you permission. But if you are, if you are using public API, it means you can collect public data from that researcher, from their uh, ORCID records. And for member API, you also get the benefit to connect, means that you can add affiliations or contributions to the researcher's ORCID record. I will provide uh, some demonstration later on and you can see clearly. Yeah, and also you have the ability to synchronize, means add data as well as getting data from ORCID on an ongoing basis. Yeah, here it is. Uh, so for our pop, uh, ORCID now works uh, globally with different systems to make them as ORCID enable systems. So those systems all support uh, implementation, implement, implementations with ORCID. So if you are using these systems, you don't need really extra work. You can start ORCID integrations. So we, and in publishing, we are working with different uh, publishing systems, and we are also working with different uh, research management systems. So in my next few slides, I'm going to illustrate more about how 
Open Journal System works with ORCID. The reason I'm choosing Open Journal System today is I know some um, of the audience here, they are quite keen or they are interested in learning more. So this is why I'm choosing using OJS as demonstration. And you can find more uh, information for other systems from ORCID's website. Yeah, so I do want to, yeah, let's start from OJS system. So OJS system is actually an open source solution to manage and publish scholarly journals and it's developed by the Public Knowledge Project PKP in Canada. And PKP is actually an ORCID partner. And if you are working, if you are using OJS, OJS system, it means that you can collect authenticated ORCID IDs and you can uh, perform your member benefits as well. So ORCID profile plugin is a feature, a tool developed by uh, OJS, by PKP. The plugin supports OJS 3.2 1.2 and above version. So if you are using previous OJS version, you need to upgrade in order to benefit from this plugin. And as you can see, uh, the, here is a blog link. You can learn more from the blog post. Also, I've attached uh, some useful links for your reference in the end of my slides. So for working integration and workflow, I do try to get go into a, a little depth here. So just I want to just start every integration starts from sandbox testing. So if you want to test public API, you as an individual, uh, remember that public API is only uh, eligible for individual use. So if you are interested as an individual to use the public API, you can go to the orchid.sandbox website and you register for a sandbox orchid ID and you, you will see the develop tools tab uh, in the interface and you can complete the form and you can start testing. And as an organization or if you are uh, and researcher alone, and you do want to uh, test a little bit about Sandbox member API credentials. You can also complete the form here. You apply for uh, uh, Sandbox credentials and we will help you. And if you complete your test, the next step is make your integrations live. So for public API, you can directly use those. You just go into the public uh, production ORCID registry, ORCID.org, and you sign to your ORCID record. Uh, likewise, you go to the developer tools, you can start to use the public API. But if and you want as a member organization or as an organization, yeah, as a member organization, you want to use production member API, ORCID membership is mandatory and you need to contact us and we will work with you to let you know how to print your integrations live. And here I'm going to track, uh, just uh, directly share with you the, the screenshot from OJS, ORCID profile plugin. So either way, if you, Let's imagine you get sandbox credentials. So you can actually fill in your sandbox credentials here. So as the image shows, it's member sandbox credentials and you can fill in the API key and your client ID stream. These two sections, you will get these two when you apply for your member sandbox credentials. So this is the uh, image to let everyone know better about how it works. And once integrated, once you start, you make the, your ORCID integration live, uh, I will talk about from different perspectives. So for users, if you are, for example, I'm an author or I'm a journal editor or I'm, I'm a, a reviewer, uh, I'm going to sign to a journal that using OJS as a submission system. So for me, I can create an OJS account. Of course, I need to because I'm going to make a submission or I'm going to review an article. 
And at the same time, you can create or connect with your ORCID ID as the image shows here. So if uh, in the first image, you can show the icon here, it's called create or connect your ORCID ID. And once you uh, click the button, you can see the uh, image. If you have ORCID ID, you just sign into. If you haven't, you can get new one. And once you complete this authentication process, the uh, your information from ORCID will be uh, automatic populated into the OJS interface. Like you see, you can see your name and your last name. These sections, the information here is pulled, collected from ORCID profile. And uh, if you once you integrate it, editors, what can, add, what can editors do? Editors can actually request IDs and update permissions from authors and co-authors during production by sending an email. So if you are an editor now, you sign in to your OJS uh, management admin interface. You can, uh, in this chat, in the screenshot, you can see you can help, uh, your, you can help to send an email to request OK authorization from your contributor, like your author. So this is really convenient for editors to help authors that may not be 100% uh, clear about how to authenticate his ORCID or her ORCID IT into your journal. And once integrated authors, what can authors can do? So as in the publishing practice, sometimes or most of the time, the first author will help the, the other co-authors to fill in their information. So in that sense, if I'm the first author of the article and I'm co-author with others, I can help my co-authors to create or connect to their ORCID records also by automatic sending an email to them when I type in those information in the OJS interface during the submission. And uh, this slide is particularly for ORCID members. So if the publisher, the publishing organization is an ORCID member, use member API, publishers can assert published works directly to an author's ORCID record. For example, uh, with during the permission, uh, during the submission process, the author or the contributor will authenticate into the journal system and uh, like the, Message here said your ORCID ID has been verified and successful associated with the submission. Uh, in the end, by after you finish publishing this article, those information can directly connect to the researcher, the contributor's ORCID record, and the source name will be yours, like open journal system or your journal's name. We call this assertion. We let you to help us identify the reliable information of those of this article of or other publications. And here I'm just want to reiterate the cross auto update in action. So for publishers, uh, there are also cross member cross ref members. You can include the ORCID ID when you uh, deposit your DOIs in the metadata section, and then researchers will receive a notice from uh, when they log into their ORCID record uh, to let them know that the Crossref is going to update, help you to update their research, uh, your research activities with Crossref DOIs. Uh, in the next section, I'm going to share more about how to work with ORCID. Three ways to get involved, I will say. The first is to encourage and support your researchers in getting, sharing, and using their ORCID ID. That's very important. And the second will say that investing in integrating ORCID into your system. We welcome all members or non-members, I should say non-members, to start from testing sandbox integrations to give you a clearer picture of how to integrate with the ORCID. And the third is that once your integration is live, try to connect data and two from your research ORCID records to support information use more automatic, more, more automatic and then reuse across organizations. And take actions. So yeah, 
here are some tech home messages that I want to share with everyone here. So first is making the most of Crossref by depositing the orchid into your metadata when you uh, going to apply for DOIs. And the second for publishers that you can do to sign the publisher's open letter to also uh, show your encouragement for your authors to uh, use ORCID and also for yourself to use ORCID during the publishing process. And third is that you can start to integrate with ORCID. And by the fourth is that making the most of ORCID by following our best practice procedure. And here are some uh, webinars and resources I want to highlight. I'm going to share that uh, in the upcoming next few days, there is going to be another webinar, uh, particularly focus, focusing on using OJS. And here are some uh, useful links. So like OJS video with ORCID and the plugin documentation. And also we do have some resources for publishing. And thank you. And uh, please feel free to email me if you have any questions or you can use the chat window to raise any questions. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Um, Estelle, thank you so much. Um, that was that was lots of lots of really useful in depth information. Um, yeah, as you said, um, so um, there are some questions coming in through the um, the chat window. If anyone's not on chat, then we can we can read out the the questions and then just just reply to them. Uh, yeah, Rachel, do you want me to start? I think there are two questions in particular with ORCID or... Yeah, that would be, yeah, that works. <laughs> yeah, 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 thank you. Uh, I think there is a question. Uh, yeah, we, we will share with the, uh, we will share the slides, so no worries. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think, yeah, we, we, this op webinar is open for everyone, so thank you for attendance, but I don't think we will provide any certification, but it's, it's, uh, but it's good that we have you participated here. And the other question is that, yeah, uh, if you have, if you had an orchid, if you have had an orchid account, but you haven't used it for a while, it's okay. It's just there. It won't disappear. Okay, an orchid ID is created to be like a permanent ID, so it won't vanish. It won't disappear. We do have some. Um, guidelines for how to end the uh, ORCID ID, but no worries. If you have an ORCID ID and you don't use it for a while, it's just there. And yeah, and the other question is about some membership fee. Yeah, I, I do want to mention that uh, I know uh, we are, uh, we are internally to discussing some different tier models for small organizations to join but those now are still under discussion for now i will say it's good if we can work if in your country you do have an existing consortia so please contact them if you don't you will we are welcome to contact me and uh if you are a startup you are, or if you are a non-profit organization you will get discount Your, any question or comments? I see a question about membership fee, but I'm not sure whether it's for Crossref or for Orchid. <laughs> Yeah, I can start from Orchid and Rachel, you can follow up. <laughs> okay, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's for Orchid. Yeah, uh, let me just, direct, it's the membership fee structure is all available on Orchid website. So I will just say, if you Google Orchid membership fee, just 
pop out. And yeah, anyway, so for our ORCID membership, we have basic member and premium member. We, and we always encourage members from start from basic. And if you have further needs, you can definitely upgrade to premium. And for uh, basic member, I think the annual membership fee is 5,120 or 50 yeah but for uh non-profit organizations you will get a 80 percent discount 20 percent sorry 20 percent discount for a stop up organization you will get 80 percent of discount so it depends on how your organization runs what entity you are Uh, it's it's for it's in the U.S. dollars. Sorry, I want to mention the membership fee is all in U.S. dollars. And yeah, okay, system. Okay, yeah, the and uh, for from the orchid side, uh, we it's always uh. Er, er, uh, in ORCID, the principle is that the ORCID record holder owns their ORCID data and their privacy. So, based on each researchers, they can give different. They can give different access to each integration system. So, I can share with you some screen if that's helpful. And I think I can share with you everybody the link about membership fee. Just hand me for give me a second. Uh, yes, just let me get this. Here it goes. I share the link to Orchid membership fee in the chat window so for you can take a look. And I, yeah, and I just want to share that the Orchid system, yeah, we share the metadata of your article. Yeah, it is. Yes, we share the metadata of article and different sections as well. So, if you, uh, if a researcher has a like TV documentary as one of his research outputs activities, this can also be collected to from, uh, you can also collect this information to your system as well. It's not only limited to publication data type. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. I will just say as far as I know now, the OJS plugin only supports for 3.1.2 version and above. That's what I have. And uh, the, it, the plugin actually is developed on the community, not from ORCID. So we welcome your uh, questions. And I definitely help to relay this to the OJS site to see if they have any other ideas. But yeah, at the present, the plugin also su uh, only supports OJS 3.1.2 and above. Let me see. There are a couple of questions. Sorry, Estelle, lots of questions for you. Um, there's a question about um, from Anjum saying that he's receiving a message about the reactivation of yeah. an ORCID account. Is that just like a prompt if you haven't used it for a while or? Yeah, I think I, I think it will be great if you can share your, the screenshot, you can communicate, you can uh, directly email to support.orchid.org and we will help you if there are any further questions. Yeah, email to us <laughs> and we are happy to share. Yeah, because I think I need to see the, your message a little bit clearer from the screenshot and can help you to provide relative support. Yeah, because I know it's sometimes, <laughs> you know, sometimes I update my ORCID records all the time and sometimes I don't touch, like, you know, sometimes I just haven't published anything for a while. Yeah. Um, so it, and it doesn't mean, so yeah, as you said, support at ORCID.org will be, will be, will be able to help. Um, we'll be able to help with that. Um, and then there's one question. I think we talked about this a little bit and everything else, um, but just about um, 
the fact that, yeah, lots of things related to ORCID are more related to researchers. So talking about the, the role of those who run um, academic journals and why they might use um, ORCIDs, I think, um, and encourage their, their authors to use ORCIDs. Um, I think from my perspective, um, like from working with publishers, they think that A, it's supporting their researchers in terms of sort of good practice. But I think, um, I think a good thing as well is that, um, a good thing is that it will, it also helps increase the, um, increase the visibility of the journal. So I think as an academic journal, you can collect, you can collect orchids from your researchers, you can publish them when you publish the articles online, um, and you can just help educate your, your authors about what, what orchid does and why they might want to use it by integrating it into, into your publications. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I think from the journal perspective, always about having, uh, always about to help journals, publishers, or editors, authors to better identify themselves and help to connect, identify, uh, uniquely identify their contributions. I think it's all about that. And uh, I know for the publishing side, you know, publishing, publisher always serves to be the first resource for the following research uh, evaluation or even for the grant evaluation. So this kind of the first step for publishers to work with ORCID uh, as the uh, trusted resources. Yeah, and I think I, I do see other questions. Yeah, uh, yeah, I do want to mention a little bit about the security stuff. So as I uh, raised before, the principle of ORCID is that every researcher owns their data. So there are three levels of uh, visibility settings into your data. If you set to private, it's only private. Nobody can really read or collect or connect, uh, read your data. That's the first number one um, principle. And uh, we do uh, and then the other is that we that's why we highly recommend it to be a part of ORCID because in that sense you, you will ask your per permissions from your researchers only by asking permissions from researchers that you can help to update or help to uh, send connect data into their ORCID profile and the oh yeah, and the other question is about yeah research activities. So yeah, every researcher has the ability. You can just sign to your ORCID record and choose the research activities you want to share with other. But ORCID is not a like data like full text database. So uh, we are not we don't upgrade that way. So you don't really need to upload your uh, PDF into ORCID. We, 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 we just don't save those stuff. And I will say that it's about a place for you to connect your research outputs. So we welcome you directly contribute your research outputs. Like you can share with the metadata, like TV documentary or even art music stuff, but we are not a full text database. Yeah, you can also, you can, I think we, we I think I in the work section there is a column you can uh choose the work types you want to uh record it in your orchid profiles and I think we support about thirty six up up to thirty six or more. Um there's a question in the question and answer. Um so, oh yeah, it's just come into the chat as well. Um, yeah. There's a question obviously about the, the OJS plugin. It said as far as we're aware, there's there's not one for the OJS version below yeah. 3.1, but that's not to say that, that that's not to say that, you know, it, it couldn't be developed because it is it yeah. is yeah. it is open source. Um, but the kind of the the one that you guys have worked with on open journal systems is the kind of supported one is is for three point one point two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, yeah, thanks for the great illustration. Uh, 
definitely something doable, but I will just say the community effort now is also uh, only covers 3.1.2. But if, yeah, I think it's a community effort and you, you are welcome to directly contact PKP to let them know your needs, I will say. And yeah, and I do want, <laughs> there is another question about uh, it. If you create an kid ID at first, but uh, you accidentally, accidentally find that you create another one. We do have some mechanism now we call merge. You can help, uh, you can merge your two ORCID IDs into one, but an ORCID ID is permanent. It's a persistent identifier. So it, it won't just delete it. You know, you cannot really delete an ORCID ID, but there are other ways. And uh, if you still have questions about those, um, aspects, you can still write to us the support.orchid.org uh, email. Um, uh, oh yeah, there's a question about like if you're, if you're not connected with, with open journal systems, I think even if you're not, you can still, you know, um, you know, if you're, and it depends what perspective you're coming from, but if you're a journal editor and you're not using open journal systems, you can still ask the authors in your instructions for authors, ask them to provide their ORCID IDs when they, when they, when they send submissions into your journal. Um, you can still publish those with the paper when they appear online. Um, and as said, there are cross-ref tools like the, um, if, if you're a Crossref member, um, there's the Crossref web deposit form or the metadata manager tool that members use to register content with Crossref, who they can either do that in supplement to or instead of open journal systems. So even if you don't use OJS, you can still, using the web deposit form or metadata manager, you can still get the ORCID IDs that you ask your authors for into um into crossref so that the auto update can can work yeah thanks rachel i think it's a great point Okay, um, if we give just a couple of minutes in case any more questions come in, as I said, just if you, if you need some time to think, um, like Estelle said, just um, you can get in touch via email as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I just want to highlight that if you are a cross member now, so uh, don't hesitate. Just try to see how you can work with us. I think starting from public API or start from testing sandbox is great enough. Yeah, and I'll just add in our support team address if you're struggling with the, um, instead if you don't use open journal systems, if you're a Crossref member and you want to send in ORCIDs and you, you think you, you need some more help with that, then our support team can help from the, from the Crossref side. Um, if it's an OJS integration issue, then we'll probably just pass you to ORCID or to Open Journal Systems because they're really the, you know, they're, they're sort of the experts on working um, from that perspective. Okay, Rachel? Yep. Yeah, any more uh, additional word or statement, maybe? Um, I don't think so. A question's just come in. Um, yeah. with, oh, about open open journal systems and about the about the the versions. Um, like I think. I think more and more of the the kind of OJS functionality, certainly around the the Crossref stuff. Um, that I'll talk about sort of later on is is 
is set up to work with OJS version three and above. So I know it's, I know it's kind of, it is work to do to upgrade, but I think, I think it's going to be a better bet to take the time and make the effort to, to upgrade rather than hope that someone will develop tools for the older versions of open journal systems. Because I think as well for the older versions at some point, PKP still try to support those, but at some point they might not do so. So I think there are a couple of reasons that it's worth thinking about moving to a later version of OJS rather than hoping that things will be set up to work with, with previous versions, just because I know that that's where PKP are sort of trying to, to concentrate their efforts. Yeah, same here. Yeah, and I think that's um, a good point. So, um, yeah, you can obviously, um, for those of you who are um, RJI members, um, they'll be able to they'll be able to help um, help with questions um, and help with setup as well. So that's that's a really good point. It's why it's worth having sort of local representatives and and sponsors etc. to be able to help with these um, with this kind of like best practice. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I I think maybe. I think maybe if there are no more questions, like I, I think certainly on behalf of Crossref, I'd like to say thank you for for inviting us to um, to speak today. And I think we we hope that you've that you've all find the the content useful, and we'll share both the slides and a recording of the webinar in case you need it in future. Estelle, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I just want to say thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Tanzio, for making this webinar happen. And thank for everybody's participation and the questions. I think it's really great to have the occasion to interact with each other and to see uh, how the community thinks and what we can do to support you. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah, thanks to us, though.